Welcome to the most horrible history lesson ever, or should that be the best ever? Bits of history that your teachers could never tell you, with all the gory bits left in. <coughs> Kellogg's has teamed up with Horrible Histories, and with the writer Terry Deary, uh, that's me, <coughs> to bring you a series of disgusting tales from some of the most famous periods in history. Some of them are so foul, you may even have to hold your nose and close your eyes as you listen to them. This is one of six CDs in the series, available free on special packs of cornflakes, frosties, cocoa pops and rice krispies. Each 30 minute CD is exclusive to Kellogg's, so you'll be one of the few people to know about some of the darkest secrets from the days of old. You may just want to eat your breakfast before pinning back your ears. Enjoy! <laughs> I'm Terry Deary, author of the Horrible Histories books, and when I went to school, history was really horrible. Well, it wasn't so much the history. It was my horrible history teacher. He used to pick on me. I mean, really pick on me. He used to give us tricky facts like, Henry Tudor took Richard III's crown. Henry VIII took Henry Tudor's crown. Then he tried to test me with hard questions like, Deary, who took Henry VIII's crown? And I'd say something stupid like, Please, sir, it wasn't me. I just wish he told me the truth about the terrible Tudors. And the Tudors were truly terrifying, torturing tyrants. Even worse than teachers. The first Tudor had the blood-stained body of his defeated enemy tied to a horse and shown to the people. The message was clear, you don't tangle with a Tudor. The last Tudor had her boyfriend beheaded on a blood-stained block. You don't mess with Queen Bess. And in between, there were thousands of people hanged, burned, boiled and chopped, just to keep the Tudors on top. This is the story of the fun-loving family and the people who lived uh, and died in those days. It's a sad and savage story. It would bring tears to the eyes of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It may scare you witless, so be warned. Listen to this with your fingers in your ears. When I think of the Tudors, I think of Henry VIII and chopping people's heads off. He lopped off the heads of two of his wives for a start. <laughs> nice man. He even had the head of the Countess of Salisbury lopped off and she was about 70 years old. The Countess decided she wasn't going to go quietly. The axe was given to a boy. He'd never done this before and he made a bit of a mess. I wonder what he'd have said if he'd written a letter home after the execution. Tower Green, London, 1541. Dear Mum, started my new job as executioner today. It's not as easy as it looks. I have a nice uniform. You'd be proud of me. Except you wouldn't know it was me because Henry's the execution is secret. Anyway, the boss, uh, Robert Cratwell, whose name I can't tell you because it's secret, said I could start with an easy one. It's the old Countess of Salisbury, he said. She's nearly 70 years old, so she'll be no trouble. Seventy, I said. If she gets any older, her head'll probably just drop off. <laughs> I laughed. I didn't know the joke would be on me. What's the old trout done? I asked. Nothing, Robert said. She's never had a trial or been found guilty. But her son, Cardinal Pole, was a Catholic and he started stirring up trouble for the king. So Henry had the Cardinal's old mother thrown in the tower a couple of years ago. And the King made sure she suffered in there with terrible food and no heating. The old woman will be glad to be out of it. Then he gave me a few last minute lessons in chopping and sent me off to do some target practice on the turnip. I was spot on. That turnip was sliced as neat as the ones that you put in your stew, Mum. But there was no one watching, was there? And turnips don't move. Imagine the shock when I found 150 people gathered round the scaffold. I was shaking with nerves. 
Would you mind putting your head on this block? I asked her, ever so polite, just the way you taught me. Blow me, but the old woman says, No, a traitor would put their head on the block, but I'm not a traitor, so I won't. Her two guards grabbed her and held her down on her knees, but she was struggling all the time. They couldn't hold her head down because I'd have cut their hands off. And that means she could still move her head around. Then she looks up at me and says, catch me if you can. She started bobbing and weaving and I started chopping. Well, I made a right mess of her shoulders before I finally got her in the neck and finished her off. It was my job to hold up her head and cry, behold the head of a traitor. I was that scared, I think I said, behold the head of a tater. The crowd were booing and throwing things at me. It was awful, Mum. But Robert's back now and I'm getting extra lessons. In the meantime, I'm working away in the torture chamber. They don't mind if you're clumsy in there and you don't have a big audience. Give my love to the kids and the cat. I'll be home next week to help with chopping the firewood. Love, your little Georgie. Kiss, kiss. Kiss. See, you didn't tangle with a Tudor. The other thing you didn't do was fall sick. Here are a top ten of terrible Tudor cures you would not want to try. See if you can guess what they're for. At number ten, we shave your head and smear it with the grease of a dead fox. And that will cure baldness. At number nine, swallow nine head lice mixed with ale every morning for a week and that will cure a bad liver. At number eight, take some young frogs and swallow them whole to cure asthma. At number seven, rub a hangman's rope against your forehead to cure a headache. At number six, skin a dead donkey and wear the skin to cure rheumatism, aching bones. At number five, take some spiders, cover them in butter, and swallow them whole to cure a bad cough. At number four, mix the blood from the black cat's tail with some cream and drink it to cure sickness. At number three, cut a pigeon in half and slap it on your sore spot to cure plague. At number two, crush a human skull to powder. At number one, boil a red-haired dog in oil, add worms, herbs, and marrow from pig bones, and put it on the sick area to cure gout. That's a swollen foot. Horrible history's warning. Do not try any of these at home. Wait till you get to school and try them on your teacher. <laughs> Where did this Tudor family come from? Well, Henry Tudor's family came from Wales and he was about 13th in line for the throne. He decided to invade England and snatch the throne from King Richard III. Henry's invaders met Richard's army at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485 if you really want to date. But there's a curious tale that the superstitious Tudors used to tell about a ploughboy who could see into the future. It's a gruesome but a gripping tale. The story of the palace prophet. Robert Mixon wasn't too bright. He was just 16 years old in 1483 and only fit to follow the plough. Robert didn't speak much and when he did, he didn't talk a lot of sense. One day, he stopped ploughing and suddenly called out for no reason that anyone could see. Now, Richard! Now, Henry! Oh, badly done, Richard! Well done, Henry! Henry's the winner! His fellow workers shook their heads sadly. Daft as a brush, they muttered, until... The next day, the sensational news arrived. At the very moment Daft Robert had been calling out those names, the Battle of Bosworth Field was being won and lost. And, just as the ploughboy had dreamed, 
It was won by Henry Tudor and lost by Richard III. Now, Robert Nixon was no longer the village idiot. He was a great prophet. News of the ploughboy prophet reached the ears of the new king, Henry Tudor, now Henry VII. The king sent for young Robert. At that very moment, Robert, hundreds of miles away, knew it. The king will send for me, he whispered. That's good. He'll make you rich, lad. But Robert turned pale. He began to shake. No, 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 he moaned. He'll starve me to death. Within two days, the king's command arrived. The miserable ploughboy had to obey. He said goodbye to the villagers as if he knew it was for the last time and set off for London. Henry was no fool. He tested the powers of the ploughboy. Can you find a hidden jewel? he demanded. Robert found it. Robert passed every test Henry Tudor could think of. You're a wonder boy, he said. You will have to come and live at court. You will have comfort for the rest of your life. Uh, what? Uh, are you not happy? You'll starve me to death, the prophet said softly. Henry gave a laugh. That's one prophecy that won't come true. Here, Marshal, take Robert to the kitchens and see that he gets all he ever needs to eat. And Robert lived a good life with the best food and even seemed to forget the threat of his own prophecy. One day, Henry had to leave London. He left his marshal in charge of the palace and in charge of Robert Nixon. Then the marshal too was called away. The man worried about the boy. He worried for his safety. The other servants could be spiteful in their jealousy of Robert, so to make quite sure the boy was protected, the marshal locked him away in a tower room. The marshal had problems once he left London. Problems that kept him away. Problems that made him forget the imprisoned prophet. The marshal held the only key to the tower room. By the time he returned to the palace, Robert Nixon was dead. He'd starved to death, just as he said he would. Richard III was the last English king to die on the battlefield. Wearing his crown, he made himself the clear target for the soldiers of his enemy, Henry Tudor. Richard charged straight for Henry and cut down the Tudor flag. Not to mention the man holding the flag. But his horse was brought down and he was chopped to bits by Henry's soldiers. The old story that the crown was found hanging on a thorn bush and handed to Henry is probably untrue. But here's a fascinating fact. Richard was buried in an unmarked grave. His stone coffin was paid for by Henry Tudor, who went on to become Henry VII. There is a story that the coffin became a horse trough for many years. Later, it was broken up to make steps for a pub cellar. The message was clear from the start. Never tangle with a Tudor. And never tangle with a Tudor teacher. <coughs> My school days were bad. Tudor schools were even worse. Tudor school lessons went on from dawn till sunset with just one break for school dinners. If you lived a long way from the school, you'd have to get up in the dark so you had time to walk. The roads were cold and muddy, dark and dangerous on the short winter days. And the rules were rotten. Here are a few that we might have today. Rule 1. No pupil shall wear a dagger or other weapon. They shall not bring to school any stick or bat, only their meat knife for dinner. Ever tried eating soup with a meat knife? It's impossible. Rule two. This was at Manchester Grammar School, by the way. It is ordered that for every rude word spoken in the school, the pupil shall have three strokes of the cane. <coughs> Rule three. This was from Oundle School. Pupils shall not go into taverns or alehouses and must not play unlawful gambling games with cards or dice or the like. What? Not even snakes and ladders? <coughs> Rule four from Hawkshead School. Punishment for losing your cap 
a beating. <laughs> Punishment for making fun of another pupil, a beating. Na 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 na. <laughs> There were even school rules for eating school dinners. Don't wipe your mouth with your hand or your sleeve. Don't let your sleeve drag in your food. Don't lean on the table. Don't pick your teeth with your meat knife. Punishment for breaking the rules? A beating, of course. But the good news was the healthy school meals you got. For breakfast, you got bread and butter with a little fruit. For lunch, dry bread, meat and weak ale. And for tea, some dried fruit and nuts or fresh fruit in the summer. Healthy eating. It's a pity King Henry VIII didn't try it. Henry VIII was the most terrible Tudor of all. His problem was he was spoilt. His first wife, Catherine, didn't give him a son and heir. Divorce her. His second wife, Anne, didn't give him a son and heir. Behead her. <laughs> no, no. Anne was beheaded with a sword. <laughs> That's better. They say Anne's head came off so quickly, her lips were still moving for a minute or so after. We don't know what she was saying, probably. Hey, where's me body gone? His third wife, Jane, did give him a son, Edward. But then she died. <laughs> Wife 4, Anne, turned out to be too ugly, so she was divorced. Wife 5, Catherine, was a flirt, so she was beheaded. No, no, it was the axe this time. Wife 6, another Catherine, survived. But why was Henry so horrible? I think it's because he was spoilt rotten. If you're a king, then no one dares to say no to you. I bet you're not allowed to forage in the fridge or slurp straight from the saucepan. But what if you were a young king who could do what he liked? A young, hungry king. A young, hungry, bossy king. He got so fat he could hardly move. And he got very bad-tempered as a result. In fact, I reckon if Henry had heard of healthy eating, he wouldn't have been such a terrible Tudor. My terrible teacher would say, You can't say that! So I won't say it. I'll sing it. Let me explain Henry's horribleness in this sad little song. Henry VIII was a big fat man Loved to stuff his face at the frying pan Maybe if he'd been a little bit littler He wouldn't have ended up like Adolf Hitler You can't say that! Oh yes he can! Catherine of Aragon was his first wife He gave the poor woman a load of strife Calf and the fat man had no boy kids So that put their marriage on the skids Henry, he married Anne Boleyn But Anne was a lively lass and she did sin She went to her death with the swish of a sword The women in his life were never bored Henry VIII was a big fat man He loved to stuff his face up the frying pan if he'd stayed away from the cakes and buns He'd not have ended up like a Attila the Hun If he'd stayed away from the sweetie jar He'd not have ended up like Dracula You can't say that! Oh yes he can! Henry, he married Jane Seymour She was the one he really adored She gave him a son and she dropped down dead He didn't have a lot to luck, it must be said Anne of Cleves was his fourth, of course But when he saw her face he said, she's a horse! So Henry, he gave Anne a sad divorce Which wasn't little Annie's fault, of course <laughs> Catherine Howard was number five The cold act she could not survive Papa was six, her lucky number Because she saw Fat Henry six feet 
Henry the Eighth was a big fat man. He loved to stuff his face in the frying pan. If he'd stayed away from the beer and wine, he wouldn't have ended up like Frankenstein. If he'd stayed away from the custard and kipper, he wouldn't have ended up like Jack the Ripper. Henry the Eighth was a big fat man. He loved to stuff his face in the frying pan. I'm glad he stuffed his face with everything. Otherwise, he still could be our king. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Henry may seem incredibly cruel to us, but he wasn't unusual. His son became. King Edward the Sixth, and he was a spoilt brat like his father. One day, in a temper, he took his pet hawk and tore out its feathers. <coughs> Henry's daughter Mary came to the throne, and she became known as Bloody Mary for her cruelty. She started burning people at the stake. The executioners tried to make the executions quick by tying bags of gunpowder to the victims, but the gunpowder didn't always work, or if it did. At the wrong time. Sorry, a bit late. Then, when Henry's daughter Elizabeth I came to the throne, she started torturing her enemies on the rack in the terrible Tower of London, stretching them out till their arms and legs were torn. But you have to remember, a lot of people were cruel in Tudor times. Even their sport was cruel. You go to a football match for fun. Tudors went for fights. The pitch could be miles long from one village to the next. The ball was a bundle of rags, and the winner was the team that got the ball back to their village. There was no referee and hardly any rules. And you thought your school netball team was rough. But football wasn't the only cruel sport. Tormenting animals with dogs was known as baiting. A Tudor sports report for that was even worse. Every Sunday and Wednesday in London there are bear baitings. The bear pit is circular with stands around the top for spectators. The ground space below is empty. Here, a large bear on a rope was tied to a stake. Then a number of great English mastiff dogs were brought in and shown to the bear. After this, they baited the bear one after the other. Although the dogs were struck and mauled by the bear, they did not give in. They had to be pulled off by sheer force, or their mouths forced open with sticks. The bear's teeth were not sharp, and they could not injure the dogs. They'd been broken short. When the bear was tired, a white bull was brought in. One dog at a time was set on him. He speared these with his horns and tossed them so they could not get the better of him. Lastly, they brought in an old blind bear. Which boys hit with canes and sticks, but he knew how to untie his lead and ran back to his stall. In Congleton, Cheshire, the town had its own bear, but it died in 1601. There is a story that the council wanted a new one, but didn't have any money, so they ordered that the town bible be sold to pay for it. <laughs> Up in Scotland, the Tudor Mary, Queen of Scots, ruled, but she upset the Scottish people. Had some bad habits. It has to be said she was suspected of blowing up her husband. Mary ran away from her angry Scottish lords and fled to England. She thought her cousin Elizabeth I would help her. Elizabeth helped her into jail for 19 years. Mary plotted to escape and have Elizabeth murdered, so Elizabeth I had Mary, Queen of Scots, executed. <coughs> well, wouldn't you? You'd think the Scots would be upset. They weren't. It was the Spanish who were really mad. Within a year, they sent a great fleet of ships to attack England and avenge Mary. Anyway, the mighty Spanish galleons sailed against the little English ships. Queen Elizabeth herself spoke to her gallant troops. A report written long after Queen Liz died 
said that she made this great speech. My loving people, I have been told to be careful for my safety, to take heed when I stand before my army for fear of treachery. But I tell you I would rather die than distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. My greatest strength is the loyal hearts and goodwill of the English people. That is why I come amongst you at this time, not for my pleasure, but determined in the heat of battle to live or die amongst you all, to lay down mine honour and even my blood in the dust for my God, for my kingdom and for my people. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too. And take scorn that Spain or any prince of Europe dares to invade the borders of my realm. One hundred and thirty mighty galleons left Spain in the summer of 1588. Only fifty returned late that September, thanks to the English sailors under the command of the mighty Admiral Francis Drake. The fleet cost the Spanish a fortune, and I'm not surprised. They were only getting about ten miles to the galleon. <laughs> ten miles. Oh, never mind. The Tudors came in with a charge of knights and flashing swords. It was the last such charge in the history of England. They went out with another great charge, but it was the charge of a single horseman. Queen Elizabeth I took too long to die. She became feeble and lost all the Tudor energy that had driven England for over a hundred years. The country was like a car running out of petrol, slowly coasting to a stop. No one cared. Even the servants in our last palace at Richmond left the place filthy and uncared for. Then, on the night of the 23rd of March, 1603, the Queen's lady-in-waiting, Philadelphia Scrub, crossed to a palace window and opened it. She slipped the sapphire ring off her finger and passed it out to her brother, Sir Robert Carey. It was the signal he'd been waiting for, a signal that the last Tudor was dead. Even though Philadelphia and Robert were the Queen's cousins, they weren't going to hang around and weep for the dead woman. They were going to make their fortune by being part of the future. Robert jumped onto the first of a string of fast horses he had arranged along the road north. He galloped through the city, past the carts loaded with the victims of the latest plague, and out of the city. By evening he was in Doncaster. Just 60 hours after leaving London he clattered into Edinburgh. He was covered in blood from a fall on the road through the borders, but King James VI of Scotland welcomed him and sat down to hear the news he'd been waiting for so long. Elizabeth is dead, you are named as the next king. The days of Tudor terror were finished as the slimy Stuarts took over, but that's another story for another time. History's always like that. No sooner have the old died than the new takes over. The old are remembered and preserved in history books. Some of the old are remembered fondly. Henry VIII is remembered as a strong ruler and Elizabeth has been called the queen of a golden age. The pain and the misery they caused are often forgotten. To see the past clearly, you don't just need history. You need horrible history. We hope you enjoyed learning about the despicable goings-on of our ancestors as much as we did when we made these CDs. Don't forget to watch out for other CD audiobooks on special packs of Kellogg's cereals. You can learn about... The Rotten Romans, the measly Middle Ages, the vile Victorians, Incredible Island, and the vicious Vikings. Look for the whole horrible lot. Horrible histories are written and read by Terry Deary and produced by Nick Baker for Testbed Productions. Original music is by Danny Fromaggio, sound design by Dirk Mags. Horrible histories are published by Scholastic Children's Books. And they're really horrible! Ah!